Arminius, a name which possesses vastly divergent meanings for different peoples across the world and throughout history. To some, he is the duplicitous, barbarian arch-traitor of Rome's early imperial age, somewhat responsible for the eventual decline and fall of the Roman Empire. On the absolute opposite edge of the scale, Arminius was a great hero of Germania, the patriotic warlord chieftain who struck a great blow for Germanic freedom against a tyrannical power which was never going to leave the tribal peoples beyond the Rhine in peace. As with most figures and events in history, the truth is somewhat greyer in tone, a fact that we will hopefully show. Welcome to the Kings and Generals channel and our video on Arminius, victor of the Teutoburg Forest. Shout out to Netflix and its new historical TV series Barbarians for sponsoring this video. Barbarians is a brand new TV series set in antiquity with the backdrop of the famous Battle of Teutoburg Forest, in which the legions of the Roman Empire, led by Publius Quinctilius Varus, are ambushed by the alliance of Germanic tribes led by the former Roman auxilia Arminius. This dramatization of the events of 9 AD is everything history fans were asking for for years, with awesome production quality, attention to detail, historiosity, and great actors. The characters speak Latin and German only, making the show truly atmospheric. We have been clamoring for historical movies and TV shows to return to our screens, and Netflix is giving us just that. So we'd be watching this great new show even without being sponsored. Streaming it is the best way to show how much we as a historical community care about seeing more historical dramas made. So stream it on Netflix if you're subscribed, or subscribe to stream it if you're not. In the otherwise unassuming year of 18 BC, Augustus's new Roman Empire was undergoing an extensive period of administrative, political, societal and military transition. The Republic's conquest of the Mediterranean world was all but concluded, and the Roman world now stretched from the Nile to the North Sea, from the Atlantic to the Euphrates. Augustus believed that such a vast expanse of territory required armies geared towards frontier defense, rather than further expansion, which might lead to imperial overreach. To that end, the legions were redeployed on Rome's frontiers to defend the empire's integrity. However, that formidable challenge wasn't only bestowed on heavily armored, gladius-wielding legionarii, but also on the auxilia cohorts and allay of lightly armed allied infantry and cavalry, raised from the client kingdoms, affiliated tribes, and recently conquered peoples. It was in close proximity to one of Augustus's most vital imperial frontiers, the Rhine, that Arminius was born a prince of one of the Cherusci tribes around 18 BC. Inhabiting the deep, dark forests of northwestern Germany near modern-day Hanover, the Cherusci bordered other barbarian nations such as the Chatti, Lengobadi, and Chauci. Several years into Arminius's life, the Germanic prince was taken from his father, Segima, by Roman agents and transported to the imperial capital along with his brother Flavus. The circumstances of this hostage agreement are unknown, but it is almost certain that the tribal Cherusci were treaty bound to surrender some of their aristocratic military class in return for peace and possibly Roman patronage. Siphoning off fighters and leaders from tribal societies such as Arminius granted Rome a number of benefits. If these warriors were serving the empire, then they weren't causing it trouble by raiding and organizing anti-imperial coalitions. Moreover, immersing foreign leaders into Roman culture from a young age meant that when these men eventually returned home, they would hopefully remain firm allies. Arminius had a number of benefits he could gain from being in service of Rome. Compared to the standard legionarii, who were drafted to serve 25 years, less tightly controlled auxilia such as Arminius may have used his status in Germanic society to muster a band of several hundred followers, with whom he then joined Roman armies for the considerable salary and prestige among his own people. Some historians speculate that Arminius may have had his grand plan of treachery in mind from the start. For whatever reason the Germanic prince served in the Roman army starting in 4 AD, 
he seems to have done so with considerable dedication. During his time in the imperial military, Arminius became fluent in Latin, acquired Roman citizenship, and became a member of the Equites class. Such achievements were at least partly a consequence of his high societal status, mixed with equal parts competence and prowess. Arminius's years with the vaunted Roman army also imparted crucial knowledge of its strategy, logistics and tactics. While such martial training did serve its natural purpose of forging the Germanic leader into a learned imperial commander, it also showed him the vulnerabilities of Roman armies. Arminius may have even witnessed said vulnerabilities during a gigantic conflict known to the Romans as Bellum Batonianum, but to us as the Great Illyrian Revolt of 6-9 AD. Tribal forces in Pannonia and Dalmatia united in great strength and rose up against the empire, striking out at its urban centers in the region and winning minor victories during the initial stages of the war. The noticeably overstretched military resources of Rome, Arminius and his Tarisci auxiliar warriors included, converged to subdue a threat described by Suetonius as the greatest since Hannibal. Arminius gained experience and learned lessons that would have been invaluable for his future plans. Firstly, the sluggish Roman war machine took a long time to redeploy and respond to large revolts, and had relatively few spare troops. Despite Augustus's efforts, the empire was overextended. Secondly, warlike Illyrian tribal leaders, similar in organization to Arminius's kin, were able to organize large forces and best Roman legions on home terrain. In one such clash near the city of Sirmium, close to modern Belgrade, Illyrian tribesmen attacking from marshes and dense forest came close to destroying a Roman army completely by attacking its camp by surprise as the sun went down. Although these experiences were no doubt important for Arminius, perhaps equally important was the role Illyria and proximity to Rome in general may have played in his change of heart, if he ever needed one. As Roman armies slowly began to roll back and crush their opposition, atrocities against peoples somewhat similar to his own Cherusci must have made an impact. In fact, the grim fate of the rebels may have acted as an omen of his own people's future, with all the death, humiliation and cultural destruction it might bring. If they rebelled, as he imagined his ferocious, freedom-loving tribe probably would, the atrocities of reprisal would follow. Rome would have to be confronted now, on the tribe's own terms. In 7 AD, this thoroughly Romanized and war-forged Arminius, now in his early twenties, returned to Cherusci territory, ready to assume the role of his father's heir, leaving Flavus behind in his place. However, he also remained a Roman auxiliary commander in some form, prepared to join an imperial army when ordered to do so. At around the same time, Publius Quinctilius Varus became the first governor of Germania, with the aim of maintaining stability, preventing defections, and assuring loyalty. To achieve this, regular intimidation expeditions would be launched through disputed territory to showcase Rome's military might. However, as foreigners in an unfamiliar province, Varus and his administrative staff required supply, reinforcement and shelter from tribal collaborators in order to accomplish their tasks. One of these true imperial sympathizers was another of the Cherusci tribe's noblemen, Segestes, who had a daughter called Thusnelda, with whom Arminius eloped against her father's will, causing animosity between the two men. It is worth lingering on this Germanic firebrand princess for a moment, as even with the considerable paucity of sources that we have, it is obvious that Thusnelda was a notable maverick even among her famously maverick people. Although it is impossible to tell for sure, Tacitus's implication that Arminius simply stole his wife is probably false. It is far more likely that Thusnelda simply went with the Cherusci prince by her own free will, or because she fervently concurred with his bid for Germanic freedom. Unfortunately for Varus and Roman ambitions in the north, the governor unwisely bypassed men such as Segestes, 
largely because he had another, far more credentialed candidate in mind. Compared to his comparatively unknown kinsman, the Latin-speaking, Romanized, educated Arminius, honored equestrian and heir to Segema's chieftaincy, was considered a far safer bet. Equally unknown to the Roman leadership in Germania, however, Arminius was already using his dual authority as both an auxiliar cavalry officer and a Germanic chieftain to enact his scheme against the Roman Empire in secret. To strike at such a powerful entity, extensive plans had to be formulated and many allies gathered. Finding warriors and tribes who were willing to fight against Rome was easy in certain parts of Germania, as the mighty Suebi and Sugambri were utterly and permanently hostile to the empire. Even those tribes that often blew hot and cold, such as the Chatti, might turn renegade for Arminius if the situation looked optimal. However, any advantage in recruitment fostered by the martial ideology of a Germanic warrior to defend his homeland against Roman expansionism was probably countered by other factors which hindered the efforts to gather a sufficient force. First among those would have been the dispersed nature of Germanic tribes. Rome itself had a population of one million or so people during the early imperial period. It was a giant metropolis compared to the Gallic hilltop forts encountered by Julius Caesar, which contained merely thousands. But even the relatively sparse Gaul was more densely populated than Germania. Evidence suggests that there may have been a settlement about every half mile or so on average, likely to be located in fertile river valleys and other good agricultural land. Moreover, these forest hamlets house populations often fewer than 100 people. One site near Mepen was home to only 30 people, only 10 of whom were capable of bearing arms. There were troops to be raised, that was for sure, but as the Germanic prince and his representatives went back and forth between hundreds of small forest villages and tiny hilltop hamlets in 8 and early 9 AD, he would have been forced to balance innumerable inter-settlement and inter-tribal rivalries, deal with conflicting self-interests, and prove that he, a Romanized leader, was indeed a true Germanic warrior. Although no details of Arminius's mustering techniques remain, they were clearly effective. By the time he was ready to launch his strike against Varus's unaware army, he likely had between 18,000 and 25,000 fighters. Arminius and his inner circle of conspirators also selected a brilliant location in which to ensnare and ambush the Roman army at its weakest, on the march and not formed up in a battle array. That place was a narrow track near Calcrisa, located between a hill and a bog, known to us as the Teutoburg Forest, passable enough for an army to move, but with enough obstacles to give its soldiers trouble whilst doing so. Not content to leave the Romans' destruction purely to the terrain, Arminius began artificially modifying the area. At a fork in the path which went around the northern edge of a nearby depression, for example, the Germans appear to have excavated an entire segment to reveal water. Then on the other side, they arranged natural brush and plants so that when the legions came around the hill, they saw only one path the one Arminius wanted them to move down. On the edges of this track, the Germans also constructed walls of grass and soil overlooking the trail, using material from the track itself. Firstly, mutilating and narrowing the trail in such a manner would render it even more difficult for a heavily armoured imperial army to move, form up and fight how they were used to. Secondly, the actual walls of sod camouflaged by leafed branches and other foliage, could be used to hide Germanic warrior contingents before their ambush and provide cover against Roman projectiles. Once everything was prepared for the climactic clash, the Germans waited for their opportunity. During 8 AD's frigid northern winter, Varus dispatched a number of messengers ordering subordinates and allies to march for Vetera and unify with his forces for the campaigning season. Arminius obeyed as instructed, accompanied by an ally of his Germanic cavalry. When all of the usual logistical concerns were dealt with, 
Varus's column crossed the Rhine and began its advance deeper into Germania. In addition to the primary contingent of about 14,000 legionarii, the Romans were encumbered by supply wagons, heavy crates containing soldiers' pay, and other essentials. The entire column was fronted by allay of native auxiliar cavalry employed as scouts, likely commanded by Arminius. From its winter base at Vetera, the army pushed east through the Lippa Valley for several weeks, making stops at a number of places including modern Halton, Orberaten, and Anbeben. Each time Varus's legions stopped for a period of rest, they constructed one of their marching camps, resulting in a chain of fortifications leading back to Vetera. During this early period in the campaign, when the Roman army was in the vicinity of its safe bastions, Arminius played his part, accurately and concisely reporting to Varus on the state of things when required to do so, and fading into the background. When the advance continued inland towards the Vesa, Arminius's plan was that Varus would turn to him as a trusted, competent guide. From Anrebn, the Germanic cavalry blazed a trail northwards into Cheruski home territory, while the legionaries followed in their wake. About a week into the maneuvers, Arminius sent a rider to the rear, informing Varus that a site for his summer camp had been found somewhere near the Vesa River. Although it seems obvious to us that the army was already in mortal danger, they actually viewed this as allied territory of the Cheruski, a tribe who served as one of the empire's greatest friends in the region. During its four-month occupation, Varus used this base of operations to conduct building projects, arbitrate intertribal disputes in the Roman fashion, and begin planting the seeds of Roman rule in Greater Germany. All the while, Arminius attended dinners alongside Varus, gaining his trust, while at the same time using his place as a cavalry commander to ride out and, secretly, shore up tribal support for the coming attack. That part of the German plan was going well. However, Varus had been lulled so far into a state of false security by the area's passivity that he seemed content to stay where he was, playing the role of supreme judge and politician rather than military commander. So, hoping to draw him away, Arminius deviously organized for his Angrivarii and Bructerii allies to launch raids into Cheruski territory. When reports of this barbarian effrontery reached the camp, Varus's faithful auxiliar commander advised him that the best way to show how beneficial a relationship with Rome could be was to help fend off an enemy. Taking Arminius's word as law, Varus dispersed some troops to keep watch over the helpless communities, but unrest continued unabated, and even Roman soldiers working on infrastructure were attacked. Tricked by Arminius, Varus enacted no countermeasures as the situation grew ever more dangerous. However, the long-awaited scheme almost came undone due to the actions of a single man, Segestes, whose daughter had been abducted by Arminius before the campaign. Fully aware of the plan, he publicly denounced the young Cheruscan prince and revealed all to Varus. The air in Varus's central chamber must have gone cold at that moment, Arminius's heart skipping a beat as it seemed as though everything was ruined. But, for whatever reason, almost certainly bolstered by the Cheruski's prior reliability, the governor kept confidence in Arminius and moved on with other matters. When the unrest was subsequently discussed, the reprieved German prince firmly argued that this revolt needed to be put down swiftly before it spread to other tribes. When a counterpoint was raised that it was too late in the campaigning season to do so before the weather became unbearable, Arminius saw his golden chance, advising Varus of a route which would allow operations against the rebels and a timely return to the Rhine. The Roman army departed summer quarters on its new route slightly to the northwest on September 7th, 9 AD. That same afternoon, Arminius mounted his horse and asked Varus for permission to ride home, where he claimed additional warriors would be ready to fight the enemy. With the governor's nod, he galloped off with most of his contingent, drastically reducing Roman reconnaissance capability 
but promising to be back within three days. It would instead be the final time the two men ever met. As Varus unwittingly closed in on the Calcresa mousetrap, Arminius circled around and rode feverishly to rendezvous with his closest allied tribes. Most of the Cherusci and Angrivarii were sent to man the ambush positions in their thousands, while Bructerii contingents began launching hit-and-run raids against the plodding Roman column, slowing it down and diverting it through the deadly pass. Then on September 9th, Varus's 17th, 18th and 19th legions, along with all of their hangers-on and friendly auxiliaries, plunged headlong into Arminius's snare. Surprised by at least 10,000 Germanic fighters assaulting from the wooded hills to their left and trapped by dense marshes to the right, the Romans were massacred where they stood, their harsh training to fight in formed-up ranks rendered utterly useless by the Cherusci prince's thorough preparations. Arminius and his Cherusci cavalry remained safely out of the way for most of the battle, possibly content to weaken the allied tribes in order to cement his own power following the glorious victory. At the very climax of the battle, however, Varus committed suicide, and the Cherusci cavalry delivered the coup de grace to his army by annihilating its final desperate detachment of cavalry, followed by a charge into the Roman rear. In the chaotic aftermath, Varus's corpse was found, decapitated, and the head sent to Chief Maribodus of the Marcomanni as either a threat or a call to arms. The latter instead dispatched Varus's remains to Rome. Nevertheless, when news of the Roman defeat spread through Germania, uninvolved Germanic tribes rose up and annihilated virtually every imperial installation east of the Rhine. Despite the undeniable triumph, Rome was nevertheless able to redeploy its considerable resources and embark on savage campaigns of reprisal in the subsequent years, led by generals such as Tiberius, who succeeded Augustus as emperor in 14 AD, and Germanicus, the empire's prodigious starling. The latter in particular began racking up a considerable array of plaudits and bagging prizes of undeniable prestige. Not only did he recover some of the Romans' revered eagle standards from Germanic clutches, he also captured the vociferously defiant Thusnelda during a campaign to rescue her father, Segestes, from Arminius's siege. Accompanying her to Rome as prisoners was the pair's young son, a three-year-old known as the Melicus. A few years later, they would both be paraded through the grandeur of the imperial capital during Germanicus's post-victory triumph. These expeditions reached their apex in the year 16, when Germanicus blitzed through Germania in a lightning campaign, winning three battles against Arminius at the Vesa River, Edista Visso, and the Angravarian Wall in quick succession. Better still, his forces were able to recover the remains of those men who had been butchered and the eagle standards of Legios 17, 18, and 19. Among the army of retribution was Flavus, Arminius's still Roman brother, whom the victorious Cherusci prince taunted in the course of battle. In the wake of Roman withdrawal after Germanicus's minor victories, Arminius's rivalry with the Marcomannic king, some of whose allies had defected to Arminius, flared up to an even greater extent. The strength in manpower wielded by the victor of Teutoburg cannot have been negatively affected too much by Germanicus, as he was able to come off better during a skirmish with Maribodus in 17 AD, resulting in his influence growing even further. Unfortunately for Arminius, factions within the Cherusci splintered in the belief that the prince was trying to become a king. Among the dissenters was Segema's brother, Inguiomerus, who went over to the Marcomanni in defiance. Not learning his lesson, Arminius continued attempting to increase his own authority, leading to his assassination at the hands of other Cherusci kinsmen in 21 AD. We know little of this event, except for Tacitus's description. Arminius began to aim at kingship and found himself in conflict with the independent temper of his countrymen. He was attacked by arms, and while defending himself with checkered results, 
fell by the treachery of his relatives. The same writer, although Roman to the core, seems to admire something about the German's guile and cunning, memorializing him as undoubtedly the liberator of Germany, who squared up to the Roman Empire at the very height of its status and power, and gave it a hard punch in the face from which it never really recovered. It was only four centuries later that Roman boundaries on the Rhine changed again, during the final collapse of the West. We will talk more about Roman and Germanic history soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos wouldn't be possible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.